Coming up on the show, with orchestration and containers taking over modern app management, we're gonna take a look at the role of Kubernetes, now generally available, for managing reliable and scalable cloud-native apps using Linux and Windows containers. We're gonna look at the advantages to moving to container-based modern approaches, how Kubernetes compares to existing IT tools and processes, and what IT needs to do to take advantage of this and provide infrastructure for containers to run. I'm joined today by Brennan Burns, the co-creator of Kubernetes, who leads the Azure Container Services team at Microsoft. Welcome. Great to be on the show. Thanks for having me. So Kubernetes is really one of three different open source orchestrators that are supported by Azure Container Service, and it's just been released to general availability. But why is it that we're seeing orchestrators and containers taking over the way that people are thinking about delivering apps and services? Well, I think it's really about that handoff from developer to operator, and there's a number of different reasons for that. For the first is fidelity. So in the past, you might have, uh, as an operator, you might be handed a package from a developer, roll it out to the cloud, and it would fail, and you'd go back, and the developer would say, well, I mean, it worked on my machine. Um, but now with containers, all of the things that you need, like libraries and all of the configuration files, are moving into the container, into that package. So it's exactly the same thing that runs on the developer's laptop as runs in the cloud. And along with that packaging up, what we're seeing is this decoupling of application and operating system so that you can have a developer worry about the application package itself while uh, an operating system operator worries about the, oper uh, excuse me, the operating system itself. And then finally, orchestration provides this application-oriented API that makes it easier for people to focus on rolling out, managing, and other aspects of their application itself without worrying necessarily about the details of the operating system. So all of those things together make it easier to reliably deploy an application to the cloud or to on-prem. Because of this abstraction layer, really, there's no patching involved. And you can also start doing things like swapping out the underlying foundation with the operating systems and not affect your apps. Yeah, there's really no patching at all in either the application or the operating system. Each new version of the application is deployed next to the old version, independent of it. And when you're done with the old version, it's simply torn away. And the same thing is true in the cloud with the virtual machines. If I upgrade the operating system, I actually just create a whole new virtual machine and destroy the old one. So I'm never doing any of this imperative uh, upgrading or anything like that. This is all pretty new to me coming from an ops management background. And we're talking about a lot of management themes here. And I would have thought orchestration was really about provisioning or deployment time automation but it's really doing that end-to-end -end management. Yeah, I mean, deployment is definitely a big part of it, and I think that's part of what brings people uh, to container orchestration. But container management has much more than that because that application-oriented API really enables the management to focus on the health of your application. Is it alive? Is it doing the right things? Taking steps to repair it. And then also, when you're doing a rollout, understanding if that rollout is successful or it needs to be rolled back. Um, so let me show you an example of what this might be like by showing you a traditional application and then what it looks like containerized. Okay. So here I have a simple Node.js application. I'm going to run it on my machine. There it's running on localhost. I'm going to go view that application. I see there's this link here. I wonder what happens when I click it. And my system has died. So let's go back and see what happens when I hit reload. The server is no longer there because that's crashed and I'm actually going to have to go restart it here. Now let's take a look at how that's different when you uh, run it as a container. All right, so I've built the Docker image. Now I'm pushing it out to the registry so that I can run it in the cloud. Mm -hmm. um, and now that it's pushed out, I'm going to run it in uh, Kubernetes. So this one command line basically tells Kubernetes, I want to run this container. And there, I've deployed my image. Well, the right. next thing I want to do is see and make sure that it's actually running. So there it is. It's, it's up and running. Um, and finally, I want to expose it onto the internet. So I'm going to expose it as a service with a load balancer in front of it out onto the internet. Um, once that service is available, I can actually go and find the IP address of that service. I can cut and paste that IP address, and I can put it into the browser just like I did with my local address before. And now once it's there, I can see the site again. Okay. Now what happens when I go and click on that link that I wasn't supposed to go and click on? You can see here it's died as before, but when I go back and hit reload, the application is still there up and running. Kubernetes has noticed that the application has failed and has actually restarted it. Now, if we go back to the command line and I list my uh, containers again, what you can see here is where it used to say zero restarts, it now says one. Kubernetes actually understands that the application has failed, restarted it, and gives me that information to drive it into a monitoring system or alerts that might fire to an operator to check it out. So great resilience, it recovered from failure there in that case, essentially. So that was one container instance, and it was able to spot that issue and really recover from it easily. But how was it able to do that? Well, again, because the container represents an application, and Kubernetes is running that container, 
it understands whether the container is running or not. It's not like viewing an operating system where there may be a lot of different processes and I don't know which ones are important, which ones to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. The container really says, this is the one thing that I need to pay attention to, and if it dies, please restart it. Um, but I want to show you a little bit, something a little bit more complicated, which is how would we actually do a rollout from uh, one version to the next? Uh, of our software and do that in a safe uh, and reliable way. So taking a look at this, I have on one side, I'm going to scale up my uh, current deployment. So there are three replicas. Of course, if I want to do a reliable rollout, I need more than one replica of my service. Now that I have three replicas that you can see here, two are recently created. One was the one we created before. Now I'm going to build version two of my image. There I've built the container. Again, I'm going to push it out to the container registry. Um, and once it's been pushed out to the cloud, I can actually tell my uh, deployment, I want to move to image number two. Now, in order to see this uh, transformation from version one to version two in practice, uh, I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to run a little loop. And what this is going to do is it's going to uh, load the version that's running of the software. Now, if there are any errors, we'd expect that to see we show the errors in this uh, in the output right there. So we should expect to see a v2 pop up at some. You point. would expect to see v2, but actually, if you look at the, I just listed all the containers. Version two is actually crashing, and now I've actually rolled back version two back to version one. All the while, there have been no errors on the right hand side, so none of our users have noticed anything. So we were able to move successfully from version one to version two and now back to version one without any sort of user impact. That kind of reliability really means you can be much more agile in the way that you deploy software. It's really cool how it recovered. The user saw nothing. And it's really a lot faster than if it was, say, a virtual machine that you had to redeploy, reinitialize, maybe start up the app as the initial startup process, all those things. Now, the, the health check recovery here happened just in a couple of seconds. And we saw how it was integrated just as part of the normal rollout process. But that's really great if you can detect something kind of immediately out the gates. But if you've got a memory leak or something that doesn't really manifest itself for three or four or five minutes, will this help there as well? Yeah, you know, anyone with significant ops experience knows that it's important to have the health checks that, that validate and restart the application understand the application itself. Each application is going to have different uh, behaviors and different ways of failing. So there's a lot of flexibility uh, built into the Kubernetes health model, and I want to show you that right now. So here, you can see that we are uh, defining a liveness probe. Now, liveness indicates to Kubernetes whether or not the application is running correctly. We also have this notion of a readiness probe. And a readiness probe basically indicates whether or not the application is ready to serve traffic. So that's the difference between should I be restarted and should I be added into a load balancer. Mm -hmm. Now, in order to customize that probe, here I'm defining an HTTP request that I want to perform. I'm also defining how often I want to do that health check, in this case, 10 seconds. And finally, how many failures count as an actual failure. You may have transient problems. If it fails five times in a row, that's a real failure. Now here, for the readiness probe, I'm defining the same kind of health check, but with a different path and the same timing and uh, failure threshold parameters. So a lot of flexibility, really, to have the health check be tuned to the particular application that you're deploying. All right. So we saw v2 fail in terms of how we got it deployed out. But what if I had made all my bug fixes? I've got my third container ready, my third image. How would I go about deploying that, and, and what does that look like? Well, let's take a look at, again, rolling from version 1 out to our newly fixed version 3 that we've okay. gotten from our developers. Um, so here we go. I'm going to build that third image. And now, again, I'm going to push it out to the cloud. So once the image is out there, I'm going to be able to deploy it. We'll wait for a second for that. All right. And now we're going to uh, do the same thing as we did before. We're going to watch the servers to see what version they're serving. Right now, of course, it's version 1. Now I'm setting the image to be version 3. So now I've done my image update. I'm now in the process of doing a rolling upgrade. Mm -hmm. um, takes a little bit of time for that third image to be downloaded from the image registry. But now you've seen the first version 3 is coming through there. And it's a mix of version 1 and version 3 as each of the three replicas mm -hmm. is upgraded. Um, and you can see that process happening with the containers that we're running here. And eventually, um, everything will say v3, right? That's correct. So eventually, here we are. Um, we're going to see that there's one last v1 there that I just saw. And now it's version 3, version 3, all the way through. So the deployment is actually finished successfully. There have been no errors that any user saw. And we've moved from version 1 of our software to version 3. Um, and the user is unaware. Right. And it's important to point out the app just kept on running. But a lot of what you're showing here is what a developer might do to orchestrate that service or that update to the service. But what does IT actually need to do to get all of the kind of underlying infrastructure running? Well, I mean, really, Kubernetes or any other container orchestrator is just a program like anything else. So setting up a cluster uh, for containers is just like setting up a cluster for a database or for any other kind of application. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, and that's if you're doing it on, on your own machines or your own uh, private cloud. But in Azure, it's actually even easier. So we can take a look at what it looks like to uh, turn up a cluster in Azure. Um, here, we're actually just going to create a resource group. That's sort of an organizational group that keeps like things together on Azure. We placed it into the East US region. Um, and then I'm going to create this container cluster and tell it that I want the orchestrator type to be Kubernetes. Now, it takes a few minutes for the cluster actually to spin up all of the virtual machines mm -hmm. and configure everything properly. But eventually, once that's done, I have a working cluster. I can get the credentials that allow me to access that cluster securely, just like a database password or anything like that. Um, and now that I have the credentials, I can actually just go and via the Kubernetes API, I can see all of the machines and the software that's been provisioned. So it's really, really easy. Again, the cloud making it easier for people to provision and deploy their infrastructure. Yeah, compared to what you have to do with physical infrastructure on your own premises, that's a huge, uh, huge time savings there. Uh, long term, though, what happens if maybe you hit start hitting the app with load and you've got to manage uh, the underlying infrastructure? So in that case, actually, Kubernetes has uh, an auto scaler. So I will actually auto scale the deployment and we'll go in and we'll take a look at uh, what we see. Here's our deployment running. It's got a single instance of uh, the container and the current CPU utilization is about 14%. Um, now let's actually go and create a load test for that container. Um, we're actually going to use Kubernetes to run and containers to run the load test also. Mm -hmm. um, so, but again, the utilization isn't that high, so we're going to actually need to turn up our load test. So now we're going to scale that load test up to have 10 replicas. Um, going back over to the monitoring, the CPU monitoring for our service, you can see now the CPU has spiked up. It's over the 50% usage goal that we've set. Mm -hmm. And so the autoscaler is actually kicked in, uh, and there are two replicas of our, our image now. Um, now, if we want to drive it even further, we can actually go back uh, to Kubernetes, and we can actually scale up our load test even more. You can see here there are the two replicas and our 10 replicas of the load test. Now we're scaling up to 20 replicas. Um, and we can go back over to the CPU monitoring. There's our little stair step while we were looking at it. And eventually, you can see the CPU utilization is up over our target of 50%, so that when you uh, wait for a minute, the autoscaler will kick in, detect that, and create even another replica. So within the bounds that I've set between one replica and five replicas, the autoscaler is going to tune you up and down in response to load that you see. It's really great if I want to grow my apps out, but what if I need to actually grow the underlying cluster nodes? Right. Well, actually, so in, in cloud, in Azure Container Service, we can handle that as well. Um, so I'll show you manually scaling a, a cluster. Here, let's just take a look and uh, see just the, nothing up my sleeves. I have a cluster with three workers and one master. Now I'm going to mm -hmm. actually scale up so that I have four workers creating a new virtual machine. That's the same one command, just like creating the cluster to, to do the scaling. Again, it's creating a virtual machine, so it takes a few minutes to uh, happen in reality. But now it's been scaled up. Uh, and when I get the nodes, you can see here that I have a, a fourth worker node that can take new traffic, new copies of my application. It's been around for about 30 seconds in comparison to all of the other um, machines in my cluster. So since we're talking about all the physical nodes, underlying infrastructure, I bet a lot of people are wondering how I'd actually have visibility into all of this stuff through my on-prem ops management tools, maybe OMS or other things. Yeah, so it's, what's really great is you can plug in a wide variety of different monitoring solutions um, into either Azure Container Service or Kubernetes running on your own infrastructure. Let's take a look at what OMS uh, looks like in that world. So first, I'm going to actually just deploy the OMS agent. Uh, Kubernetes actually has this concept of a daemon set that will deploy the agent by itself to each machine as it scales up and down. So that's what I've done here. Um, it deploys it into a special system namespace so that my developers don't get confused and see the OMS agents or maybe even terminate the OMS agents. Mm -hmm. Now, if we go into OMS itself, you can see all of the nodes in my cluster, all the machines, as well as all of the containers. So I actually get this container-oriented view into my monitoring. There are those uh, web containers as well as the load test containers that we were playing around with earlier. And as well as having CPU monitoring information, I can also access logs and all of the other sorts of things that you'd expect out of OMS. What are we doing for the Windows world to bring that container and orchestration technology there? Sure. So with uh, Windows Server 2016, uh, there was support for Windows Server containers. And more recently, with the announcement of general availability for Kubernetes, we brought Windows Server containers with Kubernetes to preview. So you can take a traditional .NET app, put it inside of a container, get that fidelity of experience from laptop to cloud, and then deploy it using Kubernetes, using these modern orchestration techniques. 
Um, and also deploy and manage hybrid environments. So if part of your application is in Windows and part of your application is in Linux, you can use the same management, the same operational tools, the same deployment tools to, to manage the complete application. So really powerful examples of seeing the tech in action. Kubernetes also uh, manages and keeps everything up and the uptime consistent throughout. Uh, as a leader in the space, though, how do you see the potential for this technology and what's next for you and the team? Well, you know, I think the most exciting thing really is that the container orchestrator is just the beginning. It's really, I think it's kind of becoming the new virtual machine, and we're going to see things that are built on top of that. So mm -hmm. I'm excited about that ecosystem that's forming up that allows people to move from ideas to, to reliable services in a really short period of time. You know, Azure Container Service team is working with the upstream open source ecosystem to expand and improve support for Windows containers, both in Azure as well as on-prem. Um, and we're also integrating with Azure services. So if you're running Azure Container Service, it really wants to look and feel exactly like any other Azure service in terms of integration with Key Vault, monitoring we just saw. Also really excited to integrate with Visual Studio Code and other, all the great products that are coming out uh, of the developer side of Microsoft. And I think all of this is really going to enable container developers and operators to deploy and manage their applications in a much more reliable way with dramatically less effort. Really great seeing all this technology come together, but where can people go to learn more about Kubernetes and ACS, Linux, and Windows containers? Well, you can learn more uh, at the links below. Uh, or for training, we actually just recently announced the acquisition of Deus, a startup that does a bunch of different Kubernetes work, including training sessions and, and other sorts of support. Really great seeing all these updates. Thanks for coming on the show. And keep watching Microsoft Mechanics for the latest tech updates across Microsoft. We'll see you next time.